Okay, welcome everybody. My name is Nicholas Suzman, and this is Latin American Directions, a new show where we are trying to become familiar and know a bit more about what goes on on our side of the continent. And to start today, we are having a starring guest. We have Moises Montiel Mogollon, who's going to tell us a bit about visas, migration, Venezuela, and other issues related to this. Uh, Moises is a lawyer advising individuals, companies, and states on matters of international law, human rights, and other international areas at Lotus Soluciones Legales. He teaches international law and law of armed conflicts at Universidad de Americana in Mexico City and Universidad Panamericana in Guadalajara, Mexico. He earned his JD from Universidad Central de Venezuela and his LM in international law from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. Moises, welcome. It is a pleasure to have you as our first guest. Thank you so much. Nicolas, thank you for having me. Such a privilege and an honor to be your maiden guest uh, on this year's show. Uh, I'm just so happy to be here again. Thank you for the invite. Great. Uh, so let's get uh, right into our topic. So tell us a bit about Venezuela right now. You live in Mexico City but you are from Venezuela originally. So if you could just provide the audience with a brief overview of where Venezuela is, where it comes from. And I know it's a hard question uh, for a short <laughs> show, but I know you'll do your best. Okay, I'll, I'll try and be as specific as possible and as quick as possible. So, well, as you know, Venezuela is a South American country. It's actually neighboring Colombia. Uh, while for most of the 20th century, uh, it. Signed show, it showed signs, sorry, uh, of you know, becoming a prosperous and stable democracy uh, with its shortcomings and pitfalls, whatnot. Uh, so it ultimately took a turn towards authoritarianism with the elections uh, back in 1998, in which Hugo Chavez, as we all know, uh, resulted the victor, and he uh, then proceeded to undermine the institutions, the economy, and you know, the country in general. Uh, <clears throat> former President Chavez died in 2013 officially. And then his successor, an appointee, Nicolas Maduro, who, who up until the time was his uh, foreign minister, took up the reins and continued uh, the so called Chavista revolution. Uh, so the, the, the thing about Venezuela is that it has been in a steady decline ever since Chavez took power. Of course, I, I don't mean to say that the country was perfect but before then, by no means. But, uh, well, you know, we had some democracy, some economic prosperity. Yes, there were issues of inequality and, and you know, wealth distribution, which needed to be tended to, okay? But being uh, mostly an oil exporting country, uh, well, the, the country took the opportunity to ride the wave, huge wealth amassed, uh, thanks, to the oil industry. So it is that landscape that welcomes Chavez into power. And uh, he then proceeds to, well, uh, some say to extend or to adapt the Cuban model in Venezuela. Uh, I, I don't think I need to go too much into detail. Chavez is a fairly popular figure uh, in, in modern politics or was because he's now dead. And then his successor, Nicolás Maduro takes up the reins. The Venezuela inherited by Maduro is a Venezuela that no longer is propped up by the, you know, historically record high oil prices. It is also a country which has begun to disintegrate politically and socially, uh, mostly uh, as a consequence of Chavez's policies. Okay, and then, and then again, in, in, as far as uh, Latin American authoritarian leaders go, uh, Maduro lacks the charisma or the political savvy that Chavez had back in his day. So then, uh, you know, the country starts spiraling down. And, and of course, I could talk for days about this. But um, to start uh, addressing the matter at hand, this starts to cause uh, a huge uptick in the numbers of Venezuelans leaving the country. Okay, uh, many experts on, on the Venezuelan migration, a uh, migratory phenomenon have actually uh, pointed out that, you know, the, there seems to be some kind of link between uh, socioeconomic status and migration in terms of waves of migrations. 
you know, it, it was first the most affluent who began leaving the country uh, normally, you know, top, uh, the, the higher classes, well-educated, uh, they migrate and they bring wealth to those countries they go to. But as the country begins to deteriorate 2013 up, to, up until present, uh, you know, migration has ceased to discriminate between classes. Now, either, I mean, whether you can or you can't afford to, you leave the country. Right now, the, the, I mean, we don't have exact numbers, but it is estimated that around 6 million Venezuelans have fled the country. Okay, we're talking a country that has a population of 30 million people. So th this is not uh, a small number in proportional terms. Most of them fleeing systematic and gross violations of human rights, poverty. Uh, there is also some talk that, that you know, all of these reasons that have forced Venezuelans to flee the country are due to the, to the US and Europe levied sanctions against the, the ruling elite in Venezuela. Uh, I think this is, well, you know, wishful thinking on the part of, of those people trying to, to prop up the government in that, you know, for example, and, and, and I would like to start, you know, addressing the, the root causes for, for this huge migration process. Um, it was last year, the UN fact-finding mission uh, delivered its report on Venezuela and found systematic and grave breaches of human rights. We're talking here uh, hundreds of political prisoners. We're talking tortures as a you know a mainstay, a mainstay. Sorry, when you're detained, uh, absolute lack of due process. And and I'm I'm only speaking from the you know the, the, the civil and political rights side. There's no no freedom of expression. There's active censorship and self censorship uh, in news outlets. And, and the quality of life overall on the civil and political dimension has crashed dramatically. On the social and economic side, uh, it is a society that just now this, I think it was this last trimester came out of an, an hyperinflationary process that has taken the best part of several years now. So the, the economy, if any, is in shambles. So uh, people flee the country. And this, this is when the whole migra the picture about migration starts to come together. Why? Most of, of these migrants, uh, they normally try to go to Colombia, which is actually the country that has received the most Venezuelan migrants. Brazil has also been another welcoming option. Okay, so the, the natural tendency is to go to South American, Central American countries. Those who can afford it, and, and right now, this is where, where the shift starts, even those who can't afford it are trying to enter the United States. And, and this is actually what, what you know, I was hoping we could discuss here. Uh, as we know, uh, the United States, ever since the Trump administration, and there seems to be some, some carryover of the policy vis-a-vis -vis migration in the Biden administration, uh, you know, the, the, the headline is, we don't want anyone to come into our country illegally. And that's okay. And I should start by saying that, yes, every country has the right to regulate migration. That every country has the right to decide who gets to come in and who doesn't. Okay. Uh, typically here in the Western Hemisphere, you know, the United States, uh, Mexico, Central, South America, there are varying degrees of policies concerning migration, especially Venezuelan migration, which has now become a very distinct phenomenon. In the case of Colombia, for example, <clears throat> uh, there have been different uh, policies adopted by successive administrations, some more welcoming than other, but in, gen in general, okay, or, or in comparison to the policies of other countries, Colombia has been very welcoming, so has Brazil. Okay, but then you see things like Peru, like Chile. Um, I'm trying to think of other, well, the, the Dutch Antilles, which are unwelcoming might be a, a severe understatement. Okay, L last year we had this, uh, this little number in Iquique in Chile, 
where you know migrants were concentrating uh, at an, at, in the in a town called Ikiken in the northern part of the country, and they had set up a, basically a, a shanty town in a very prominent plaza in Ikiken. And after several demonstrations of basically anti-migrant uh, confession by, by you know, the local inhabitants, they proceeded to burn the, the little possessions left to these migrants. Okay, so, so it's a bleak picture in general. Now, I, I would like, and, and if that's okay with you, to focus on a recent decision by the Mexican government to impose uh, entry visas for Venezuelans trying to enter Mexico. Right, right. So before that, we says, uh, oh, right. I, I just wanted to ask you a short question. We, we've had uh, several waves of migration, right? And I think all the visa process, and as a segue into, into the, the, the topic at hand, uh, Latin Americans are not unfamiliar to the visa processes, right? And as, as far as I remember, every Latin American has a, a story of collecting papers and documents asking for visas and so on, but it's not the same. Uh, for uh, people with more resources to do the visa process and people with less resources and, and so on. And I think that that fits a lot with the, with the waves of migration. And, the, and I would also like to discuss migration before Trump. We know that Trump was uh, a very particular period of, of the US relating to migration and visa processes, but it's a process that goes before. So if we could go a bit uh, to to the visa situation and the visa waves and how the, the region and the US has reacted to these different waves of migrants and differentiate a bit of, on, uh, on the treatment that these migrants have, have received. Uh, maybe we could provide a bit more of context and then we can move into the most recent decision by Mexico that I think is, is very interesting, uh, maybe as a, as a consequence uh, of, of all this process, right? Right. Um, so, Nicolas, as, as you're well aware, uh, migration uh, in, in terms of Latin America, and I think to, up to some extent also the United States, migration is normally treated as a political issue, not a humanitarian one. So, of course, uh, and, and this is why I wanted to begin, you know, making a, a few remarks about the political situation in Venezuela ever since 1998. Okay, Chavez was identified from the, basically from the get-go, as a, an ideological threat, if you will, by the United States and you know, by the, by the right-leaning countries uh, in the region. Okay, so, so, so some part, and I think currently there's a lot of them, okay, because then, then the, the, for example, the United States attitude towards Venezuelan migration, you can clearly see how it comes from political motivations. While the United States uh, has a preferential, uh, uh, I forget the name just now, but it has a preferential visa treatment or, or entry treatment for Venezuelans because they understand that most of these Venezuelans are fleeing from, a, from a, a system in which human rights are routinely, systematically, and massively violated. Okay, so, so basically there's a bit more leniency when it comes to Venezuelan migrants, at, at least directly okay uh, but then again you know the, the the history of venezuela and especially since we begin to see this exponential growth in venezuelan migrants is always informed by politics as you remember uh, a few years ago there was the lima group uh, which was actually the one the uh, uh, let's call it a coalition of countries which openly opposed maduro Okay, the current president of Venezuela actually referred the situation in Venezuela to the International Criminal Court and uh, started signaling, okay, some, some, let's call them differentiated migration policies when it came to Venezuela. Back in the day, Chile, Chile had, uh, I think it was called something like the Democratic Responsibility Visa, okay, which would be afforded only to Venezuelans. But then you can, you can always see the political strengths behind that. Okay, it's not a map, or maybe it, because you know one is not one does not exclude the other necessarily. Okay, uh, the Chilean authorities back in the day, I think it was uh, President Piñera, understood that that this exodus of Venezuelans was a direct consequence of you know the, the catastrophic situation both economically and in terms of civil liberties in Venezuela and facilitated access 
to Venezuelans. But now as we see the region shifting ideologically, some countries to the left, some countries to the right, some countries to their, well, you know, this, these crazy Latin American ideological experiments. And we, we begin, we, sorry, we, be, we begin, I'm so sorry for that, uh, to see poly, migra migratory policies shuffling. Okay, for example, in the case of the United States, uh, we, we know that the Trump administration was very, very hardliner against the Maduro regime. We know that before that, you know, the, the Obama administration uh, apparently was more on the boat of appeasement. Okay, M maybe we can talk them into not being uh, well, such adamant violators of human rights and, 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 you know, quality of life standards. Okay, and, and I think that we see those positions reflected in the, in the, migra in the migration policy vis-a-vis -vis Venezuelans specifically. So here, my, my, my idea, and I think that this rings true for the United States and for all of the region, okay, migration and visa decisions are informed by political preference, preferences sorry, of the government that is currently sitting. So right now, for example, we've seen Peru reestablishing diplomatic relations and political relations with the Maduro regime. So I, I think it would not be surprising uh, to see some some more strict, some yeah, a, a, a harder migratory policy when it comes to Venezuela, especially when we know that Venezuelans, for example, in Peru, are being used as scapegoats by the central government. Uh, you know, insecurity, criminality crime rates, whatnot. So it's easy to blame the migrant, which has, of course, produced an optic in a xenophobic discourse, anti-migration discourse. We see a little bit of this also in Colombia with the, with the mayor of Bogota, okay, who has also been using Venezuelan migrants as scapegoats. And, and this kind of rhetoric is sadly prevalent and, you know, in an upward trend throughout the region. So yeah, that, that, and that, that's kind of my main idea here, okay? Migration, sadly, in the Americas is a function of policy, of, of policy and of politics, okay? One, one being the, the practical application of the other. So, I mean, I, I don't know what to expect from the Biden administration concerning specifically Venezuelans right now, but, but we do observe that uh, basically the U.S. is, uh, and I'm, I'm going to be extremely colloquial here, but they seem to be pretty fed up with Central and South American uh, immigration. And then they, they have, uh, I would like to think, courteously asked Mexican authorities to do the dirty laundry for them. Absolutely, I, absolutely. I, I don't know if that- that's, that's a perfect segue for, for our next issue, right? Uh, so yeah, Venezuelans, um, try to get out of the country any way possible. They get to Colombia and then they cannot stay there because maybe the conditions are not given for them to uh, make a living there. And they start like walking up the continent basically, right? Uh, and now we're starting to see how, not only for Venezuelans, but also for, uh, for, for, for Central Americans and so on, a series of obstacles are being created throughout the path basically. Uh, the most recent ones being Mexico at the beginning of this 2022, right? Um, and, and, and it's strange for, for, a, for a president that seems to be very prone to the social, very prone to inequality and, and so on. So how could we explain in that politics and policy uh, lens that you were mentioning, this uh, countries actually making the decisions for the US, which definitely could be a change in policy uh, from the Trump to the Biden administration, but nonetheless, you can you can feel certain reluctance, if we can call it like that, uh, to the migration to the migration issue, right? Uh, so yeah, I, I just want some thoughts on on your part about yeah, this. I, you know, I'm, uh, that's actually something I've been thinking a lot about lately, and and you know, working a little bit on that. I, I, there's a very strong contradiction. Mexico is historically famous worldwide and especially in the region for a very, very heartwarming tradition of, you know, being a, a reception country. In the, for example, the, the law governing the status of refugees here and, and uh, asylum seekers is 
and I dare say it's one of the most advanced and, and more protected in the region. And I dare say even globally. Okay, Me Mexico, sorry, Mexico, well, ah, same thing. Uh, Mexico has a, a very strong tradition of offering safe shelter to people who flee their countries. Okay, even they even use what we call the expand the expanded concept of refugee that not only encompasses people who are fleeing individual persecution, which we would we would assimilate to political persecution. Okay, so so that would be asylum in you know basic US parlance, but they they actually incorporate what we call the Cartagena concept of refugees, okay, which encompasses people who flee you know, grave systematic and nationwide uh, uh, collapses, of, you know, basic civil liberties, basic human rights. And the, Mexico grants or recognizes the status of refugees for those people. So on the one hand, make, we have a very welcoming country, okay, whose laws and policies reflect a, a very healthy feeling towards migration. But at the same time, uh, we had, uh, this was last week, Mexico, uh, and here's the starting point. Historically, there is a, a visa exemption agreement between Mexico and Venezuela. Venezuelans have never required visas to enter Mexico, nor Mexicans need visas to enter Venezuela. Okay, I, I, I don't, I am, I will confess, I don't know the exact date when this agreement started, but you know, it has been going on since forever. So it is now very surprising uh, because, you know, then we keep track of the, of the refugee flows of Venezuelans, especially here in Mexico. And there, while there has been a significant increase proportionally in terms of, of you know, the, the total numbers of uh, refugee seekers and asylum seekers that Mexico is receiving on a yearly basis, the trend is not comparable to, for example, other countries in South America. Mexico is not receiving that many more Venezuelan migrants seeking refuge, seeking asylum here in Mexico. I mean, th there is, of course, growth in the numbers, but it is not as significant as, say, Colombia, Brazil, Chile, Peru, Bolivia, or even Argentina. So it is very surprising because when, when we analyze the decision by the Mexican government to require visas, effectively rescinding this agreement with Venezuela to, to, uh, uh, to not uh, request visas of each other. We are, we, and, and they quote us one of the motivations of this decision, the fact that uh, you know, there's human trafficking, the, the, in Spanish, this, there's a, a colloquial term for that. It's called coyoteo. So basically people go to, to the coyotes who are human smugglers or people smugglers, rather. Uh, so they're citing, you know, concerns on human trafficking, violence, uh, irregular migration to require visas of Venezuela. Now, if you connect this to what I just told you, there has not been a significant increase in Venezuelans coming to Mexico, requesting asylum, requesting refuge here. It is true that there has been uh, an uptick okay, in the number of Venezuelans that are using Mexico as kind of a, a bridge to get to the United States, more often than not illegally, okay? And, and as we see, the Biden administration is outsourcing uh, its migration policies for Mexico to enact. Since, you know, it is easier to get into Mexico, you do not require a visa, and then you just cross their border as, you know, any other illegal uh, immigrant. So again, I cannot think of any reason why Mexico would on its own enact this type of policy except to serve the express desire of the US authorities to you know, quell migration at all costs possible. So why not outsourcing it? Right, right. and we says, uh, just gambling a bit with this uh, considerations to, to in that inspired this measure, how do you think this measure would actually help to solve those issues or intensify them um, through, through this policy? Okay, uh, Nicolas, le let me be blunt with you. Trying to create obstacles to migration 
historically, I, I mean, there's statistic, endless amounts of statistics behind this. Visas don't work to deter migration. Okay, what they do is they create more, they create more, far more dangerous environments because people are still going to try and cross into the United States. The only difference that these visa requirements are going to mean is that people are going to be crossing from the southern frontier of Mexico illegally and then the northern fr frontier of Mexico again illegally. So you're going to expose them to more human trafficking, to more risks, to more, I mean, any kind of criminality that we can associate with migration processes. You're subjecting these people willingly and voluntarily to this. Visas do not deter people who are fleeing systematic and massive collapses in their respect to their human rights in their host countries. They don't work. They're legal countries, as I said in the beginning, countries can, they, ha they have the power to regulate who comes in, who comes out. Okay, but as a matter of, of effectiveness or efficiency, visas are probably the worst measure that available to countries to try and you know cater to the situation to the situations of massive flows of migrants. Right. Okay, Moises. And just last question in the last minutes we have as a Venezuelan, as a lawyer, as a professor of international law, what's the message you would like to send to the region and to policymakers both in Latin America and in the US if you could have a chat to them? Absolutely. Uh, I, I would start by reminding that, yes, and as I have here in the, in the brief time we've had together, every country has the right to regulate their borders and their migration policy. But migration, and, and especially Venezuelan migration, is not a matter of you know, freely wanting to go and live the American dream in the United States. It's about trying to survive. It's about fleeing uh, at one of the worst dictatorships in the region so humanitarian considerations should at least inform policy making and decision making in the, in in this context let us not forget that human the the right to to request and receive both asylum and refuge is a human right it is enshrined in the american convention on human rights it is implicitly stated in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. So states have a duty to, at the very least, hear the petition, to inform people crossing international borders that they have a right to request or, or to ask for international protection. So I would, if, if I had you know, a couple minutes with policymakers, I would just try and remind them of that. It is not only a moral duty, but also a legal duty. Thank you very much, Moises. And let's hope uh, that policymakers uh, start becoming humanitarian makers and humanitarian policymakers. This was Latin American Directions with Moises Montiel Mobillon. Moises, thank you so much. And we'll see each other in two weeks for more discussions on the region. Thank you so thank much. Thank you very much, Nicolás. Thank you.